USA Emergency Broadcast Network, your source for reliable disaster preparedness information. The views and opinions expressed on this program are not necessarily the views of this station, its management, sponsors, or other hosts. If you have any comments or suggestions about this program, please contact us at radio at usaebn.org. That's radio at usaebn.org. Welcome to a new Zeta Report here on USA Emergency Broadcasting Network. My name is Andre. I'm with USA EBN, and we are joined first Mondays of every month with Nancy Leader from ZetaTalk.com. Nancy, are you there? I'm here and ready to go. Today I want to talk about an odd concept, which is a favorite saying of mine, a blessing in disguise, where something that is a disaster turns out to be, hey, it's a good thing this happened. You know, uh, we're in a transformative period, and our current infrastructure and, and sociological and whatever is going to like uh, morph over to something through the earth changes to where we're living after the pole shift, probably on the barter system, probably in sharing communes, closer to nature, non-polluting, uh, the rich not getting richer at all because their money won't be worth a darn, except, well, how do we get there? It goes in stages. So every time there's a disaster, there's often a blessing in disguise, and I'll detail that. But before we go there, also at the end, I'm going to talk about the New Madrid happenings this month. A lot okay. going on there. All right. Before we go, I want our standard disclaimer. In partnership with USA EBN, Zeta Talk and the Zeta Report will be discussing the challenges of living on a planet beset with change, rising seas, increasing earthquakes and volcanic activity, weather gone wild, and the worry of what to do in a worst-case scenario. We will also inject Zeta Talk prophecy on what is coming next and advice on readiness plans and safe locations. Whenever Zeta Talk is quoted, please remember that prophecy is not fact. It is opinion. It only becomes fact when it happens. The Zetas are remarkably accurate but have been wrong on occasion. Bear that in mind. For more information on this subject, please visit ZetaTalk.com or the Zeta Report on YouTube. Often disasters have a positive effect, what I like to call a blessing in disguise. Disasters can force change. What could be the blessing in disguise with a recent hurricane devastating many islands in the Bahamas? All supplies were gone, washed and blown away, so that only devastated mankind and an occasional pet remained. And then no rescue. For the Bahamas, help eventually arrived, but after the pole shift, or perhaps well beforehand, people are likely to be left on their own. Quoting AP News, There's no food, no water. There are bodies in the water. People are going to start getting sick. Well, yes, they will. Quoting the Miami Herald, Many suffering Bahamians, baking under a blistering sun, simply wanted out, and the pace of evacuations was maddeningly slow. What if help had not come? How did any of these island people bother to have an inflatable boat on hand? Or understand that concept of flotation devices? Do any of them understand how to get clean drinking water from salt water via passive solar energy? A simple distillation device, which is often discussed here on USA EBN. This should be the lesson, the blessing in disguise from the Bahamas disaster. I'm hoping that people wake up to some of this and say, sometimes it happens after a hurricane. You see, here come the Cajun Navy or whatever on boats or people make flotation devices and maybe a light bulb goes on here or there. But it's going to get worse, not better. And so you better figure out, have a flotation device, an inflatable boat, you know, learn about solar passive distillation for drinking water. You can do that while you're bobbing around trying to figure out where land is and aim toward it. So moving on, the PG&E disasters. Can there be any blessing in disguise in the California fires? In the opinion of the Zetas, burning off uh, all the underbrush and drought-baked trees is inevitable. 
going into the time of the pole shift. That's the opinion of the Thetas. Everything's going to burn, pretty much. But there is a bright side. Diablo winds struck both northern and southern California on October 11th. Blaming dry, hot Diablo winds coming from the east, PG&E took the drastic step of shutting off power to several northern California counties on October 9th. PG&E was blamed for the Paradise Fires in 2018, supposedly caused by sparking electrical lines and forced to pay damages. Quoting CNN, PG&E cut power for hundreds of thousands in Northern California October 9th in an attempt to avoid sparking a wildfire. California's largest utility intentionally cut power to hundreds of thousands of customers, and power isn't likely to be restarted for days. For the Zetas, the 2018 fires were caused by hot earth due to friction from subduction, you know, California being subducted uh, over the Pacific Plates. The Sierras and Rockies were thrust up by this subduction process in the past, and the foothills in California shows this. Will corporate PG&E force repeated outages to save the corporate profits? What is the blessing in disguise in all these outages? Can there be one? Oh, yes. You've got the you've got the queen of blessing in disguise sitting here. I always see it. Learning how to live without the grid. No electricity. This happened in Venezuela recently, in March of 2019. The public is always advised to have batteries for flashlights and candles on hand, but few take these steps. Long term, more steps are needed. The solar panels or windmills or even crank bike generation. Extensive blackouts in Venezuela forced the public to collect drinking water from rainwater collected in the sewers. What? The loss of electricity affects more than the lights. Clean water is pumped into homes and sewage is moved along also via pumps and paddles. If all that comes to a halt, what then? Time to ponder these matters. Learn how to live without electricity. Firestorms down in Chile. Oh, this is a big one. Volcanic eruptions are on the increase, but is there a blessing in disguise in the recent fireball assault in Chile? Living in close proximity to a volcano can result to more than flowing lava and hot rocks tossed from the volcano. To add emphasis to the Zeta warning to be 100 miles from any volcano due to the possibility for falling blankets of fire. Fireballs descended on the island of Chile off the southern coast of Chile on October 3rd. I believe that island's name is Chilo. Chilo is surrounded by volcanoes off the Chilean coast. These fireballs descended like meteors, but there was no evidence of trace minerals at the landing sites, just ash where the fireballs had burned vegetation. Quoting RT, Chile's National Geography and Mining Service soon gathered scientists to investigate the strange bright objects, dispatching teams to some of the seven sites on Chilo to take samples. In a statement issued over the weekend, the scientists concluded they found no remains, vestiges, or evidence of a meteorite. No, it was something the Velikowski talked about in the past. I highly recommend his books, particularly Earth and Upheaval. They're so factual. Worlds in Collision documents mythology, but Earth and Upha- Upheaval documents di- geology and, get, and points to scientific uh, studies and the like, which should sock anybody in the solar plexus. We're not woo-woo here at all. Uh, and uh, he documents the geological changes that ca- um, happen every 3,600 years. Well, that's our friend Nibiru. Quoting Vilikowski from his Worlds in Collision. Popoval, the sacred book of the Mayans, narrates, people were drowned in a sticky substance raining from the sky, and then there was a great din of fire above their heads. The entire population of the land was annihilated. A similar account is preserved in the annals of Catuatitan, 
I know I murdered that. The age which ended in the reign of fire was called the sun of rainfire. In Siberia, the Vogels carried down through the centuries and millennia this memory. God sent a sea of fire upon the earth. In the East Indies, the aboriginal tribes relate to that in the recent past, water of fire rained from the sky. With few exceptions, all men died. The Egyptian papyrus, Aipur, describes this consuming fire. Gates, columns, and walls are consumed by fire. The sky is in confusion. The papyrus says that this fire almost exterminated mankind. This was also predicted by the Zetas, in the opinion of the Zetas. There are organic compounds in the vast tail of Nibiru collected from the asteroid belt when the Nibiru complex bashed water and life-bearing planets to pieces in the past. These organic compounds form petrol elements when they pass over hot volcanoes. The blessing in disguise? People may move away from volcanoes, the 100-mile buffer, and heed the Zeta warning to be under like a metal or sod-covered roof during these storms. Dig a trench two feet deep, drag a board across, heave it with dirt on top or sod, you know, if, uh, if you have the time, and you won't burn up. Sinking lands are a disaster already afflicting Indonesia and India. Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia, is being officially moved to the island of Borneo. Is there a blessing in disguise in hearing about this in the news? Yeah, after they constantly said that all the sick sinking in Jakarta was from rain. It's just all from rain, even though it was seawater sea washing inland everywhere in that area. Quoting NPR on August 6th, Indonesia President Woko Widodo says his country will create a new capital city on the island of Borneo, revealing new details about his plans to move the central government out of Jakarta. The capital's current location faces a number of problems, including the fact that it is sinking. Yes, it is. The whole uh, tongue, Indonesia tongue, uh, is being pushed down. Yes, and the Zetas, that was part of the 7 of 10 predictions, and it happened, and it's happening, uh, you know, and, and it's good to see it come in print. India's sinking was noted in Bangladesh and nearby Pakistan. But for the Zetas, the entire India subcontinent will be pushed down during the hour of the pole shift. Just as the towering Himalayas has been pushed up during prior crustal shifts. The Indo-Australia plate will again get a big shove under the Himalayas, drowning India. What to do with the billion-plus citizens of India? Leave it to Putin and Modi, uh, the president of India, to find a solution. A blessing in disguise. Putin is populating his Far East with refugees from the Ukraine and trying to get his citizens to move there, offering free land. Now, in a deal worked out with Modi, who provided over a billion dollars, hardworking and inventive East Indians can migrate there. I can't tell you how happy this made me. You know, I said it made my heart sing <laughs> because uh, nobody wants these people from East India. You know, uh, Australia does is no imports, no imports, no, no, you can't come in. You know, and I people say, where do I do? Where do I go? I said, well. Try to commandeer a boat and go to Africa when the time comes. You know, what are they going to do? And, and uh, China won't have them because they already have like a billion and a half of their own people to worry about. You know, so they block it up there at, at Tibet. And I'm always saying, go to Africa, you know, get a boat. But now they can run a, a, a landline through the Kazakhstan, you know, or the Stans up to east, the Far East, take a boat roundabout to the Far East. And people have hope, you know, so I have something hopeful to tell people. Well, whatever you have to do, get up there. It may be cold now, but it ain't going to be cold for long. Flooded communities around the world have yet to wake up to the obvious solution. Uh, floating communities of houseboats. Flooding survivors cling to dry land hopes, waiting for the water to drain so life can get 
back to normal, or they move to land elsewhere. The movie Waterworld dramatizes what might happen if all dry land disappeared. The Netherlands have floating cities of Uberg and Schloonschip, yes. <laughs> Quoting the Miami Herald, in the Netherlands, one-third of the country is below sea level. They want to develop housing alternatives. Instead of fighting the water, live on it. Quoting IamAmsterdam.com, Ijeburg is a collection of artificial islands east of the city currently being developed to help deal with Amsterdam's housing shortage. Projected to be a city of 18,000 residences and 45,000 citizens, it is already home to over 10,000 pioneers. Welcome to the windy and watery city. End of the quote. The Dutch floating cities are not self-sufficient, but are rather for the middle class. Impoverished regions of the world have long used houseboats for gathering fish and trading their goods in that the oceans have turned to lush now due to being seeded with Nibiru's red dust and will be abundant in ocean fish, flooding may also become a blessing in disguise, dare I say it. A small community in Vancouver supports potted fruit trees. Another in Vietnam has fish pens attached to the sides of the community. The American Indians traditionally harvested wild rice which roots in, in lake beds by boat. Duckweed is a highly nutritious salad that floats on freshwater ponds. Let us hope that houseboat communities start to flourish. Is there a blessing in disguise in the sudden overgrowth of our sargassum seaweed? Suddenly in 2015, the Mid-Atlantic Ocean and the Caribbean are being choked with sargassum seaweed. Human scientists were scratching their heads. And the beach cleaners were out there with their rakes daily. What a mess of garbage. So where is this coming from? Ha ha, it's a blessing in disguise. There's a mass of, quoting Vogue.com, there's a mass of seaweed in the Atlantic Ocean this last year at its peak was so large it stretched all the way from the Gulf of Mexico to West Africa. It's the biggest bloom of seaweed ever recorded. The brown hue of the seaweed on the surface of the water can be seen by satellites. End of the quote. This is one to credit what to the Zetas who predicted 25 years ago at the start of Zeta Talk that the oceans will be lush. Lush, as in green. This is due to the red iron oxide dust in the tail of Nibiru, which is already dusting the earth aplenty. Quoting Green Geek in 2006, Experiments in the early 1990s that seeded a region of the Pacific Ocean with iron saw a phenomenal 20-fold increase in the local photoplankton population with a corresponding decline in atmospheric carbon dioxide by roughly 2,500 tons within a period of two weeks. Hello, global warming. Carbon dioxide is going to get sucked up by the ocean. Hello, red dust in the tail of Nibiru. Oh, you're going to repopulate the ocean with fish. I mean, can't it get better? Is this sargassum seaweed mess a curse or a blessing in disguise? This explosion was noted in 2015, and at the same time in 2015, we had an explosion in the humpback whale population, as well as the green turtle and sea lions and who knows what else kind of ocean life. Massive rebound in ocean fish. I mean, it's all a chain of life, right? Starting from the little photoplanktons and the stuff that eats that, the humpbacks eats that. Uh, the, you know, the, uh, the, the humpback eats krill, a tiny shrimp creature which eats the photoplankton, tiny ocean vegetation. Quoting Wikipedia, krill are small crustaceans on the order of, I can't pronounce this, Euphasia, and are bound in uh, are found in all the world's oceans. Krill are considered an, an important tropic level connection near the bottom of the food chain because they feed on photoplankton and, to a lesser extent, 
zooplankton, converting these into a form suitable for many larger animals for which quill make up the largest part of their diet. Now, the humpback was going extinct. Moby Dick, by the way, was chasing, you know, the great white whale. That was He was a humpback. You know, but it's like, oh, they've been almost hunted to extinction for their oil and all this stuff. Now they've come back. They've rebounded. What can be better? Okay, the Amazon fires. Uh Uh-huh. Is this a disaster? No, 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 not yet. Hold on. Wait till I get my hands on it. The world was in horror recently as the Amazon burned, deliberately set ablaze by the new Brazilian president who wants to develop the Amazon. The Amazon is considered the lungs of the world because the rainforests pump oxygen into the air, estimated to be one of the sources like 20% of the global oxygen. Quoting strange sounds, the smoke of the deforestation fires not only plunged uh, Sao Paulo into darkness, but was also visible from space by NASA satellites. A record number of wildfires have torched the Amazon this year as deforestation efforts increase under Brazilian President uh, Jerry uh, Bolsonaro. But the majority of the globe's oxygen comes from the oceans, the kelp forests, and seaweed. Thus, as the land-based forests burn, the oceans are now turning lush, utilizing CO2 from the fires and returning this as pure oxygen. Quoting the sea, Seaweeds produce oxygen through photosynthesis. Marine species, including seaweed, produce as much as 70 to 80 percent of the oxygen in the atmosphere of the Earth. Scientists estimate that algae, producing an astonishing 330 billion tons of oxygen a year, more than 70 percent of the Earth's surface is water, and only about 30 percent is land. We get our oxygen from the oceans, folks, not... not uh, the rainforest. EMP is on the increase with airplanes malfunctioning and crashing and blackouts and exploding fuel depots. Is there a silver lining, a blessing in disguise? Oh. And the, it is only going to get worse in the opinion of the Zetas. As we approach the time of Nibiru's passage, more and more EMP outages, blackouts, planes going down, electric trains flying off the rails as they surge. President Trump acknowledged this on March 26th of this year, 2019, with an executive order, which I quote, The federal government must foster sustainable, efficient, and cost-effective approaches to improving the nation's resilience to the effect of EMPs. A geomagnetic disturbance, GMD, is a type of natural EMP driven by a temporary disturbance of Earth's magnetic field resulting from interactions with solar emissions. Well, he was going good until he got to solar emissions. It's interactions with Nibiru's tail. You know, but at least they they said it was Earth's magnetic field having spasms. Following this executive order, we found DARPA, an agency within the Defense Department that works on advanced technology for the military, asking the public to quick, quick provide underground spaces for tests they want to run. Well, what kind of spaces? Oh, parking lots, subways, Anything insulated from EMP by ground and concrete is my guess. Like, by tomorrow, we got to have it. We'll just use it for a few minutes. Huh? Huh? Please, let us know. What basement can we set up in? On Labor Day, a boat anchored off coast from Santa Barbara along a fault line running underwater next to the Santa Cruz Islands burst into flame. This is prime EMP inducement. Squeezed rock underwater, and all the electrical equipment plugged in for recharging as the passengers slept. EMP arching from phone uh, cell phones is of record. They had one poor sucker. 
you know, he, he had his cell phone ne- next to him, and he had an earring in his ear, and as the cell phone was charging, it arced to the earring in his ear, and they said it was by the grace of God that he was not electrocuted. He had all these horrible burns around his neck. So there you go. Don't trust your cell phones. And so what is the blessing in disguise from these incidents? President Trump, with his EO, combined with the DARPA request, alerted the public that EMP is a concern. The Conception Inferno, which has never been explained, again showed the dangers. What to do? Don't be a target with lots of electrical activity. And in my opinion, don't get on an airplane. I had a personal EMP experience here. And it was in the area. A a friend of mine in a nearby town said, the TV in the guest room just turned itself on. You know, and and all the light bulbs in my basement, you know, fried. My water heater, the filament fried. You know, I had to have the whole thing replaced. And it was clear. So the main thing is just don't have a lot of electric activity in one place. You make yourself too attractive. I run around turning off devices. <laughs> I'm serious. It's very scary. Who wants to have to replace the water heater every other day? I... Yes, climate change is happening, but it is not caused by carbon emissions or man's carbon footprint. Global warming long ago was proven to be a hoax to be a cover for the earth changes caused by Nibiru. But climate change is very real, including crop failures and the need to change our diets. So what is the blessing in disguise for the global warming hoax, which inspired a worldwide march by school children recently? They preached against petrol for cars, petrol for airplanes, and farting cows. In the opinion of the Zetas, all these things will disappear as a result of their predicted pole shift. Well, maybe not farting cows, but I, you know, it's expected that maybe people will eat all the cows because they're hungry before they get around to eating bugs and grubs and things like that. Meatless meals like lysine-rich corn and amaranth breads or duckweed powder or legume soaps and scrambled eggs from those free-ranging chickens dashing about eating bugs are the solution. Hopefully people adapt to this before the livestock disappears and the wildlife hunt it almost to extinction. Eat bugs and worms. Citizens of industrial countries are in horror at the thought, though the other half of the world includes them in their diet and even considers them a delicacy. The problem, attitude, which needs to change. Bugs eat manure and rotting things, an abhorrent thought to the delicate sensibilities of citizens in industrial countries. Quoting New York Post in 2019, Humans will eat maggot sausage as a meat alternative. Food scientists at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia, are incorporating insects such as maggots and locusts into a range of specialty foods, including sausage, as well as formulating sustainable insect-based feeds for the livestock themselves. The Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, of the United Nations report urged global citizens to eat more insects, which compared to conventional meats are nutritious, cheaper to produce, and more sustainable. Inspired by the report and other studies, several snack makers have marketed insect-based products in the U.S., including chirp chips. End of the quote. Locust swarms on the increase. Big benefit here is that locusts are edible, big time. As in the movie movie Hildago, where a locust swarm saved the day, following the pinto horse Hildago and rider to recover and press on to win the race. Thus, this is a blessing in disguise. That's actually what happened in the in the in the movie Hildago. You know, the Arab princess says to him, the locust swarm, uh-uh, this is not a curse. This is a blessing. And she clued him in, and sure enough, it proved to be true. Quoting Strange Sounds in May 2019, 
A few weeks after Iran, swarms of locusts are currently invading southern Saudi Arabia near Najirn, darkening the skies and adding a thick layer of insects to trees. Ah, just like something out of the Bible. End of the quote. Meatless burger trials are also getting the public used to the idea of not eating cows and pigs. Quoting the New York Post in 2019, Burger King's Impossible Whopper, made from wheat and and potato proteins, is going on the permanent menu. Plant-based burgers have become such a hot food trend that one of the major companies making them, Beyond Meat, is planning an initial public stock offering later this week. End of the quote. What could possibly be the blessing in disguise for the oil-soaked Brazil beaches discovered recently in September and October? Crude oil was discovered spoiling pristine beaches in northern Brazil facing the Caribbean. Then the crude oil appeared on beaches wrapping around the bulge of Brazil all the way down to the city of Salvador. Quoting the Washington Post. A mysterious oil spill that has polluted at least 150 beaches along Brazil's northeastern coast reached the city of Salvador as officials tried to determine the source of the crude sludge. The oil has been particularly hard to track as it floats under the surface of the water and can't be easily detected from planes. Floats under the surface? Well, that sounds like deep, deep water. Sure enough, tests proved this was not Brazil oil, which is pumped from offshore oil rigs, but was Venezuela crude. But there has been no tanker accidents, and Venezuela oil down along the coastline of Brazil is almost non-existent. I mean, Brazil pumps its own. Venezuela markets to places afar, not Brazil, because Brazil pumps its own. And so... Where did that? There was no tanker. Yeah, okay. Brazil, after all, has its own crude oil and it's a far better quality than Venezuela's, preferable, which must be extracted from the shale rock in Venezuela. I have read Venezuela oil is hard to refine, so people avoid it. Okay. Then there was the influence of the Gulf Stream to consider, which slow flows northward up past Brazil and Venezuela on toward the east coast of the U.S. If Venezuela were polluting the waterways, their crude oil would surely land on the east coast of the U.S., right? Or the Caribbean, but not Brazil beaches wrapping around the bulge of Brazil all the way down, down. But water is returned southbound via the deep Atlantic deep water stream, which runs deep as it is cold water, dense, and thus sliding under the northbound Gulf Stream. Per the Zetas, the crude Venezuela oil is not from a spill, but from the grinding of the Caribbean plate under the hump of Venezuela, a type of fracking action. This explanation is logical, especially since the deep water stream has been bringing material up from World War II ships, long sunk. Bales of raw rubber have been appearing on a Brazil beach, showing that the deep water stream has become more violent lately during the plate movements. That's true. They said, well, nobody could figure out why there were these bales of raw rubber and all the insignia show. Oh, that was from a ship that sank way back then, deep, deep down in the water. Well, that correlates with what the Zetas are saying. Then the situation rapidly worsened, quoting Yahoo News. Brazil has deployed 5,000 troops to its beaches amid mounting fury as the government's inaction over the worst oil spill in the country's history. The government had recovered 600 tons of oil, that's a lot, the equivalent of almost 4,300 barrels. End of the quote. What is the blessing in disguise that might come from oil-soaked beaches? In the opinion of the Zetas, coastal living is very dangerous as the globe heads into the last weeks before the pole shift and turning the pole and during the pole shift itself. The Zetas advise to be 100 miles inland and 200 feet above sea level for the pole shift. And the twisting and turning of the globe during the last weeks means there will be plenty of unexpected sloshing. 
So don't go to the beach. That's what the myth. The blessing in disguise is don't go to the beach. The common man who may not hear of Nibiru and the pending passage from the media, given the cover-up, is best leery of beaches. Better stay home up there in the hills. Okay, that's the end of my prepared comments on all that, but I do want to talk about the New Madrid. How are we doing on time, Andre? Pretty um, good. We've got about good. 10 minutes left in the feed. Oh, good. Yep. All right, all right, let me rattle through it, and then you can wring your hands and give your opinion on the New Madrid. Wow. Okay. Within, within this last, oh, September, I think we talked about the New Madrid because I felt it was going to become an issue uh, in September on the September USA EBN. Right. And uh, We did an extensive we talked review. About, We've done more than one yeah. episode on New Madrid particularly, though. Yeah, but this was very comprehensive, all the history, all the Zeta opinions on what is going to come, how it's going to lay out, you know, the big tsunami that will appear as a result of the North Atlantic plate tearing in the center of the Atlantic, you know, et cetera, every detail except current events, which hadn't happened yet, but oh, then they started, you know. On October 12th, the Hard Rock Hotel in New Orleans suddenly collapsed. You know, so, oh, a crane, a crane, must have been the crane, lost its footing, you know, except uh, a water main, a 48-inch water main, just blocks away on the same side of the Mississippi, the west side, the west side, suddenly a 48-inch water main snapped. You know, now why the west side? Because in the opinion of the Zetas, they predicted that during the adjustment, what would happen is that the Mississippi River is a, a, a weak point in the crust, and to the west, you know, they're separated by uh, by rock. You know, the rock is torn to this side or that side there. Water flows, goes to its lowest level. That's why rivers form and flow, because everything drains to thin crust sagging. Okay. On the west side of the Mississippi, we're going to have everything pulled down and to the southwest. And to the extent that after it's all over, the Mississippi may widen by 50 miles in many places because of this big, sagging, ripping. Now, the, And there's soft rock all the way you know, along the coastlines, but it goes to a point up toward the New Madrid, and there it sits as it encounters hard rock. Okay, so right now, down in New Orleans, hard rock, we are in the soft rock, which is very stretchy, right? Quoting Zeta Talk, the New Madrid fault line will first rip open where it touches the Gulf of Mexico. As the New Madrid fault line separates and pulls apart in a diagonal manner, it will give way at its weakest point, which is under the Gulf of Mexico, at the mouth of the Mississippi. Rivers flow along the lowest points in crust, which is where the crust is thin and thus has drooped. This is the start of the New Madrid adjustment, October 12th. Okay, and what went on? Now, mind you, BioCorn, which is a, a big sinkhole in Louisiana, just to the west of New Orleans, is part of that drooping and dropping, etc. And I sure hope that the U.S. government has gotten oil out of the saltwater caverns there where they were storing it for safety. It was cheap. Empty the salt water, fill it with oil, we'll we'll get it out and refine it later. It's all going to become a big smear on the on the Gulf waters if they don't get it out of there because this is, this is getting serious. Hey, Nancy? Yeah. Yeah, for a while there, they were storing natural gas in those caverns as well. Oh, it's very scary. Well, we're going to lose it. Yeah. This is our reserves. Yeah. You know, get it, get it onto containers on land, you know, uh, and make sure the yeah. fittings are tight. <laughs> okay, on that day, October 12th, the New, New Madrid region has a 3.3 quake on that day. Since the end of September, there has been half a dozen such small quakes. Well, actually, almost daily you know, there in the New Madrid area or bopping across to Tennessee, you know, beep, 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 you know all within like a 50-mile region. Since, uh, but mostly they lay on the west side of the Mississippi along with Rock Hard Hotel and also the 48-inch water main. Then a couple of weeks later, the quake swarms jumped across the Mississippi. So now we have them on both sides, and this is meaningful. 
because it's where the rock is giving way. It's all a domino effect. Stretch, stretch, snap. Okay, now where's the tension point? Over there, stretch, stretch, snap. You know, so it's kind of like uh, where it's where it's going on gives you a clue as to where it's going to happen next, hopefully. Then October 28th reports that the Midwest flooding up along the Missouri River was not draining after nearly seven months had passed. Now, mind you, every spring, the floodwaters in the Midwest drain, and so they can do the spring planting. Well, the snow melts and drains it. What happened? I mean, what changed? In the opinion of the Zetas, this was due to the Ozarks heaving, blocking drainage. Such heaving is from rock intermeshing their layers. In other words, the rock layers are forced into each other, and they don't always just... You know, what are they? They can bend or they can like intermesh, like fingers intermeshing or various things like that. And the, and this can result in a permanent increase in elevation. Where do the Ozarks come from in the first place? Why is that heaped up there? Prior New Madrid adjustments. Quoting Zeta Talk. Certainly the Midwest was flooded in late March, early April of 2019, but after seven months, these regions should have drained. Do these regions, I'm going to say, so sorry. Do these regions remain flooded every spring after the winter snows have melted? They drain. Thus, there is another reason the waters are backed up. It is of record that when the New Madrid fault line ruptured in 1811 to 1812, that the Mississippi River briefly ran backwards. It heaved there, too. Quoting, oh, end of the quote. Quick swarms on either side of the Mississippi River continued in the New Madrid region, which is where the soft rock rising up from the Gulf encounters hard rock. Soft rock stretches, and these adjustments are usually silent, but hard rock rips and jolts. This is the next step. This is where we're going to get, you know, because as one thing gives, there's stress on the next thing. As that gives, there's stress on the next thing, up along the fault line. But in the meanwhile, just for our show today on the 4th, on October 3rd, oh, Baton Rouge had a petrochemical factory uh, accident. A vessel, which they said, I don't know, what is that a container or something like that? Lost it. It, 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 it lost it. And steam, which is used to heat, keep everything warm, went, you know, but the point is they had no explanation for why this vessel leaked and it was considered oh guess what people in the area in baton rouge across the river and in the general area their houses shook and rattled oh and they heard a big boom well a boom could be you know something breaking and steam going to you know uh down there but that wouldn't make your house shake that's the ground motion here we are, moving up from New Orleans to Baton Rouge, the land to the west of the Mississippi where this chemical plant was, dropped, pulled, you know, enough to displace a uh, fitting that caused this steam release. And thank God it wasn't petrochemicals. Can you imagine what's going to happen in some of these places? You know, that there's going to be an explosion and hope and everybody in the near vicinity will become a crisp. What I'm very worried about also is not just the saltwater uh, oil storage caverns, but the fact that across the Mississippi are so many big oil and gas pipelines that go over to the East Coast, and they and they you know they don't want to port it around by boat, so they go from Houston across over, and well, what happens when we have some of these bridges rip and fall? And the new Zeta talk written today is saying, you know, take a look at those bridges and watch them. Are you getting pavement crinkling on the east and west ends? Maybe not the bridge itself because it's probably bolted and rather rigid. But what about, you know, where everything goes into the land on the other side? You know, the bridge may be going kind of diagonal, but you'll likely have rumpled pavement on the west side and the east side, and that's a clue that your your bridge is, is very vulnerable. And if you got a pipeline under that, turn it off. <laughs> don't wait for the break. I don't want to think about people frying. And that's the end of my talk.